Good afternoon, my name is Ernest and I'll be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the B2 Golf First Quarter 2022 Financial Results Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during this time, simply press start at the number 1 on your telephone keypad. If you'd like to withdraw your question, please press start at the number 2. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, you may begin your conference. Uh, thanks, operator. Welcome, everyone, to the conference call today. As the operator said, we're here to talk about the first quarter results for 2022. Um, the news release we put out is quite inclusive. Uh, we're going to we'll give you a little summary of some of the highlights of that, update you on a few things, and then we'll open up quite quickly here for for your questions. We're uh, Pleased with the quarter, uh, we had a significant beat, uh, especially when it versus our budget on operating cost, all the sustaining cost, and, and uh, earnings, uh, cash flow and earnings. So, um, very good quarter, and we can talk a little bit more about what that means in the context of, 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 of going forward. But we're very pleased with that. And once again, I think some many of you realize the challenges that the industry is facing in terms of so high, you know, inflationary pressures, etc. So we'll continue to remain committed to um, doing our thing and then focusing on, on where we can, uh, um, avoiding the full impact of higher costs where we can. We can talk about that a little bit more. Um, in terms of um, the focus, obviously, continue to be a profitable, responsible gold miner to go, to go forward. We're extraordinarily strong financial position, as you know, with a tremendous cash balance, um, virtually no debt, and, and paying the highest dividend. I see Barrett just came out today with even with their bonus dividend, they're still uh, behind us, I think we're at 3.8% yield today, the, which is the highest in the uh, of the gold producers. Um, but we're also very committed to continue to grow the company, so we want to find a balance between dividending and rewarding our shareholders for for our great performance and their support, uh, but also being able to continue to grow the company. We have great access to, to cash uh, through a 600 million uh, loan credit facility from our banks that has the ability to go to 800 million uh, completely grown at this time. Um, and just quickly looking forward to some of our priorities, um, and I'll pass it on to Mike. The priorities in terms of growth are, are we're closing in on a feasibility study at, um, at Gravel uh, and we've talked about that. That's quite uh, detailed in the news release. Um, and um, where Anaconda has become a real focus for us, as you've seen, we're now able to talk about the new resource in Anaconda, not only in the satellite, but we're starting to get some very good news as below in the sulfides uh, just 20 kilometers away from the Fricola mill. So we're going to start talking more and we'll update you on that. And then we have the potential for, we think, depending on expiration results, as they continue to be what we've seen, and it gets larger, the potential to build a second mill up in Anaconda. Uh, so it could become the Fricola complex, which we could have significant gold production from two mills in the not just the future. Bill will touch on that and give you a little more color on that. <clears throat> expiration has always been a big part of our world and a part of our success for since we started this company in zero 15 years ago, and we have some very exciting opportunities, not only around the existing mines, but we've had great success in turning in, inferred into indicated, uh, finding new reserves, but also um, also new targets in addition to existing targets, extending the amount of properties. We've had a great success, track record of success of exploration at existing properties. It was all, we're still very global in our view and our belief that the cheapest houses will always be the ones you find, so we have some sort of exciting exploration projects in our budget of Full budget of about $65 million this year, about 60 or 65% of that would be on Brownfield's expiration, and the rest is to look at some grassroots targets. So, some exciting results came out today from Orion, our partner in Finland, with the operator we, we've been doing the drilling, and, and um, I think the guys who we can ask you questions on that. Uh, sounds like the expedition group is pretty excited about early days, but excited about the potential given the discovery that they've made and given our not only our proximity being right on the boundary, but the kind of results we're starting to see is how much more else to come there. And we're drilling in interesting places like uh, Uzbekistan and, uh, and others, always looking for new new discoveries. The M&A front, we will continue to look. Uh, we've, we've, we've looked at a couple things quite seriously in the recent time, but haven't been able to reach an agreement. Um, so we continue to look. But I, I, I think time is on our side in the sense of looking at getting the Gravelati study out and seeing if that's a go. Also getting at a in focus over the next number of months. So, um, and maybe seeing our, our, our stock, which has been underperforming, seeing the share price start to um, to come up uh, as we continue to prove the, 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 the 
the value of the projects we have, our ability to operate them, and also uh, as we unlock the value of our uh, growth projects and potential expiration. Um, okay, operator, we getting to did, did everybody get all that? Yeah, no, yeah, we're good. Yeah. 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 Okay. That was Siri just to shut up. Okay. okay, so I'll pass over to Mike now, and uh, Mike can give you a run through the financial results. Okay. Thanks, Clive, and morning, everyone. Uh, so just run briefly through the operating results and some of the, the sort of key financial results that we've reported for the quarter. Firstly, on the revenue side, uh, revenue of $366 million, and that reflects the sale of 195,000 ounces at an average realized price of $1,874 per ounce. So high gold price during the quarter, and, and sales were about 7,000 ounces higher than budget, which really mirrors the higher production that we saw in the quarter than budget. Speaking of production, the total consolidated production in including our share of calibers results, was 209,000 ounces. And we saw higher than budgeted production at each of our three mines. The coal was 102,000 ounces, so just 1,000 slightly above budget, uh, and slightly above budget. That was mainly due to higher than budgeted process grade and offset by lower than budgeted process tons. And the process tons were lower as, as a, a result of a reduction in the saprolite processed. And that, that was because it was a precautionary measure to protect ourselves against some of the uh, potential supply chain problems that we saw arising in Mali from ECOWAS sanctions earlier in the quarter. Uh, we, we prioritized the processing of higher fresh ore, grade, higher grade fresh ore in the period to reduce uh, reagent consumption. And uh, that was a temporary measure, I would say. The sanctions continue there, but our supply chain was normalized and, and we built up regular levels of reagent and fuel at site now. So uh, as a result of that, separate or was reintroduced back into the circuit at the end of February, and processing is ongoing as budgeted. Um, remind you as well, Focola's gold production is expected to be significantly weighted to the second half of the year, as, as we had guided when we put out our budgeted numbers. And that's, bec that's because the second half is really when we reach the higher grade portion of phase six in the Focola pit and we have the, the new Cardinal uh, production stream fully online. That started, Cardinal, mining from Cardinal started later last year, but we, we got it fully online through the course of this year. And as Batty, 60,000 ounces in the period, that was 6,000 ounces ahead of budget, so quite a beat there, mainly due to higher process grade. Um, in, in the period, uh, we grade which was, was above budget, uh, because we mined additional unbudgeted higher grade areas, within the plant mine areas. And in addition, as, as part, you know, as, as a function of uh, shorter haulage uh, periods and haulage optimizations related to the expansion of the tailings facility, uh, we, did, we, we were able to see increased mining rates, at, which contributed uh, to the, the mining of, of, of higher than budgeted, higher grade ore in the period. But that's a temporary issue, I think, as we were working on the tailings, the TSF. But, that's us with a 6,000 ounce beat in the period. And OG Cotto, 35,000 ounces, 2,000 ounces over budget. That's really, a, it's kind of the same story for OG Cotto. Usually, it's usually slightly ahead of all factors, um, grade, recoveries, and mine door. And again, OG Cotto is scheduled to be weighted to the second half of the year, like for COLA, and that's because that's when we get to the higher grade portion, phase three of the OG Cotto pit, and also in the second half of the year is when the Wolf Shag underground mine really ramps up. Okay, to talk a bit about costs related to that production. So this, I'm, I'm talking here, cash costs, these are all on a per ounce produced basis. So consolidated cash costs for the queue were $699. So that was almost $100, $94 less than budget. And that, that's, that's uh, primarily a function of uh, lower than stripping in some areas lower than budgeted fuel for COLA, and uh, then higher than, that was partially offset by higher than budgeted fuel costs at, at Miss Batty and Ojikoto. So I'll touch on each of those now individually. So for COLA, $624 per ounce produced. That's 157 lower than budget. And that's, 
that's a primarily function of slightly higher than budget production, as I mentioned before, and then lower than budgeted mining, processing, and, and site general costs. And those costs were, were lower than budget, largely due to lower than budgeted fuel prices realized in the period. And just, just to remind everyone, and I think we've talked about it in previous calls, in, in Mali, the fuel prices are set in advance by the state, and therefore you're always going to have some timing delay between uh, costs that you might see in, the, in the, the broader fuel market and at the pump, and then what we're realizing at site. We also would lower the budgeted volumes of fuel and consumables that we utilized in the period because we, we, process, we mined and processed lower overall tons than budgeted. And mined ton, tons were lower than budgeted due to, a, again, a temporary change in mine sequencing uh, to accommodate that temporary change in sapper light -like processing. Reminder to everyone as well on the power side, the solar plant of Focola, which we got up and running last year, is, is running very nicely. And actually over 20% of the power that we generated in the first quarter of 2022 was solar. So that's been a great, great investment, I think, for current operations and as we look forward. Ms. Batty, uh, cash cost per ounce reduced $710 per ounce. That was $50 per ounce lower than budget. And that was really, again, result of higher than budgeted production, partially offset by uh, higher than budget mining and processing costs, which, again, were driven by a little bit higher than budgeted uh, diesel and HFO costs at Ms. Batty for the period. Then Ojikoto cash costs per ounce reduced $770. That was $35 less than budget, slightly lower uh, than budget, uh, and again, a result of higher than budget production and, and budgeted our operating costs that were pretty much in line with budget. And those operating costs, they saw some increase in fuel prices, but that was offset by a weaker Namibian dollar. If you, you might recall, last year we actually we saw the Namibian dollar strengthen, so it actually it, it, it increased our cost lately this period so far. We've seen the, the dollar weaken. We budgeted at 14 and a half, and the Namibian dollar to U.S. dollar for the period, and, and we saw it come in somewhere over 15. So it's probably a benefit in the period of a couple of million bucks in foreign exchange gains. Touch briefly on all-in, it's really the same story as the cash costs. So consolidated all-in sustaining costs, including our share of caliber, which uh, $1,036 per ounce sold, and that was $318 overall, lower than budget. And so it's a function of those almost $100 less on the cash operating cost side. And then also uh, higher than budget gold lamps is sold, as I mentioned earlier, and lower sustaining capex. During the period, we were $33 million, lower than budget on the CapEx side. And that part of that came from the, the, the temporary change in sequencing at Focola, so we had lower stripping in the period. We also had some lower stripping costs at um, Ojikoto in the period. And then just the timing of some fleet uh, purchases and rebuilds. So you put all those together, we were $33 million lower than budget for the period. But we, we think these are timing issues, and we expect to see those reversed later in the year. And just a couple of comments on, on guidance. So firstly, just to remind everyone I've mentioned already in this call, we are weighted pretty substantially 40% in the first half, 60% second half for production. Uh, we're maintaining our production guidance. Uh, we were 8,000 ounces ahead for the quarter. Uh, we're saying we're still on our overall guidance for the year, so our consolidated guidance is 990,000 to a uh, million, 50,000 ounces for the year. Um, we haven't changed our, our re-guide on the cost side. We re reiterate our annual cost guidance. Now, we, did, we have seen, as I run through here, a, you know, a very good first quarter where we beat um, budget on the cost and all and sustaining cost side. And I think we can expect that that could benefit the first half of the year as well. However, on the other side, we are seeing some cost inflation, uh, particularly with some, some fuel increases I've mentioned already. And there's also the capex timing issues that I that I, I mentioned as well, so that we're going to see those reverse. So I think you know we're seeing some cost volatility in the market. We're going to continue to watch it, and you know we'll we'll look at it again for the in the second quarter. So in the meantime, we've we've just maintained our annual cost guidance and and also our annual production guidance. A couple of general comments, maybe just on the operations as we've just run through them. So we're still still a big focus in Mali in in early February. We, we put out a, an updated mineral resource estimate for the cardinal zone. So in that, we had for indicated resources 430,000 ounces, and then we had an updated inferred resource of 740,000 ounces. Um, also, subsequent to the, 
the end of March, we, we completed the acquisition of the Bacalobi permit, and that, that allowed us to consolidate that whole land package from Focola all the way up to Potenko, an area of over 200 uh, square kilometers. <coughs> And Anaconda remains a big focus. We got 17 million, as Clyde mentioned, on, on the exploration site. 17 million budgeted for an exploration for Anaconda uh, for, for this year. We've got a lot of drill, five drill rigs on and active there. And then we, in, in, in late March, we put out an updated resource for Anaconda. Uh, reminder to the Anaconda includes Manicoto permit and the Botanico North permit. And that resource had initial indicated as mineral resources of uh, 1.1 million ounces and inferred resources of 2.3 million ounces. So a lot of upside in Mali. Um, we budgeted 33 million to, to start developing that Anaconda area and, with, and that has the potential, I think, with a view to phase one saprolite mining that could start as early as late this year. Could, could add 80 to 100,000 ounces per year for a production profile, which isn't in our budget right now. Cardinal is in our budget, but Anaconda is not. I think Bill is probably going to talk a bit more about this after my comments. And there's also a phase two scoping study that we're starting to look at. We're actually going to look at uh, what beyond just saprolite trucking to the Fukola mill, what we might do in terms of standalone uh, mill at Anaconda. Then at Ojikoto, we, we continue to develop the Wolfshag underground mine. Uh, first development ore production is expected by the end of the first half, 2022, and then as I said, we, we kind of move into full uh, full tilt production there at Wolfshag Underground in, in the second half of the year. A couple of comments on the income statements on the other operating results. Uh, just gain, gains on derivative instruments. We reported 19 million in gains for the period. That 13 million, that, that all relates to fuel. 13 million was unrealized and 6 million was realized. But just, just so that you've got it in your minds, so our fuel book, our hedge book at the end of the quarter, with $29 million in the money. So about two-thirds of that will benefit 2022, and we, we flow those benefits through the all-in sustaining cost number, as, as, as I realized, and then about one-third will come in in 2023. And I'll comment as well, you know, historically we've said for fuel, we, we'd hedge up to 50% of one year's needs and 25% of the next year's. We're not quite at those levels at the minute. We're about 35% of 2022's needs and about 17% of 2023, and that's because... We are realizing the benefit of those hedges, but with some of the, the fuel pricing that we've seen, it's higher. Not, not as keen to jump into the market, put new hedges on. So we're, but we're we're constantly watching it, and we'll jump in if we see like a dip in prices or something that looks like a good opportunity. Um, on a net income basis, 90 million dollars net income for the for the period. That was EPS of eight cents per share uh, for attributable shareholders company. And then on an adjusted net income basis, 65 million or six cents per share. <clears throat> Just talk a little bit about the cash flow. Uh, again, solid cash flow generating period. Uh, a reminder as well, because we're saying we're weighted so much to the second half of the year, we definitely see the, the majority of our cash flow, the greater part of our cash flows come in the second half of 2022. But even, even with that said, cash, cash from operating activities uh, in in the first quarter was 107 million, or 10 cents per share. I know a bunch of the analysts look at it uh, on operating cash flow before changes in working capital. So if you look at that number, it's 152 million for the period, or 14 cents per share. Um, I'm, we've, we've maintained our guidance on operating cash flow for the year. This is net operating cash flow, 625 million, um, and you know we have seen some higher prices that we realized in, in Q1, as I talked about. Uh, in terms of selling price for, for gold. But we're also seeing some slowdown in BAT recoveries at several sites, as you'd expect, as, as governments fight their way through the post-COVID period. So I think overall we've maintained our operating cash flow guidance at $625 million for the year. On the financing side, uh, $42 million went out in dividends. This Q, we've maintained our dividend at $0.04 cents US per share. And as, as Clive said, uh, that, that's providing one of the highest yields out there in the gold sector. Uh, cash taxes for those that are interested in such things, we haven't changed it. Uh, Clive will probably talk in detail about this because he loves talking about cash taxes. Uh, but it's, it's going to be, uh, it's, we've maintained it at 290 million, same as we guided at the start of the year. <coughs> then on the investing side, 77 million or 78 million cash outflow from investing. That's quite a bit lower. That's about almost 70 million under budget for the period. 
Uh, we had sustaining capex of 40 million, which was 33 million lower than budget for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Then on the non-sustaining side, we we're about 35 million lower than budget. That related to the timing of fleet rebuilds, fleet purchases, uh, underground development at Wolshek, just the timing of some of the payments related to that, and then some of the timing of expiration activities. Uh, but we do expect those to be timing issues, and we do expect to see them reverse later in the year. And Grand Malati, we continue to work towards getting a feasibility study done. With, you know, we should know the results of that by the end of the second or the first half of the year and with the feasibility study to come in Q3. And that left us, as Kai said, very healthy cash position, $648 million at the end of the quarter with $600 million on drawn in the revolver. And I think that concludes the comments I was going to make on the financial side. Okay. I think back, um, great summary. Thanks. Um, over the bills, we'll talk about a few operational uh, updates or actually particular, sorry, particularly on the, on the Anaconda. Yeah, I, I definitely wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about the regional Mali development and what it all means. I, I think there's a lot of questions and, and maybe misunderstandings on what we've got going on there. So I'm going to kind of work my way through it, hopefully in a, in a logical fashion, remembering that we have increased the mill to produce 9 million tons per annum, which really is kind of the basis of all the beginning stuff. So at 9 million tons per annum, we've always talked about our ability to process an additional 15% uh, saprolite material. Currently, what is included in the Facola Life of Mine plan is only the Facola Open Pit and the Cardinal uh, deposit, the early uh, Cardinal deposit uh, reserve. We have since then, as you know, freed up the Menencoto license, the Bentaco license, and consolidated by getting the Bacalobi license. So basically we have the entire belt from Facola all the way north uh, to Bentaco north. What that allows us to do is to have some optionality in, in where we're going with this. We have previously announced, and, and we're discussing with the government right now, uh, the potential to truck from Anaconda, which consists of Menacoto and Bentaco, or maybe potentially separating those and, do, and doing them individually. Both of those studies are complete. Both of those studies have environmental and social impact assessments ready to go. It's just a question now of, of which way we want to go. So we've also talked about the need to optimize the entire belt, so we additionally have a study going with uh, Whittle Consultants uh, where we're going to take a look at what is the best way to process or what is the uh, most economic way to process or from all of the various sources. Uh, that study has been kicked off. That study will be done by the end of this year. Um, so that, that also will play into our sequencing going forward. <clears throat> so what we're really talking about is, is currently is the potential to have a phase one where we truck. I, I will tell you that, uh, as Mike indicated, we, had, we have a budget, $33 million, to get that going, we have started ordering, ordering equipment. Uh, that, that's come through um, the, the uh, profile right now. We're, we're in the process of ordering equipment. Uh, I will tell you that we're in the process of designing the road uh, from that area. We, we certainly believe that can be done by the end of this year. It's just a question of which is the best way to optimize it. And then on top of that, everyone is aware, I think, that we're looking at the potential to create a standalone complex uh, up to the north to, to be kind of a regional uh, mill. Uh, so in, in that particular case, we would be looking at can we uh, consolidate some of, some of our ore based on our existing resources and, and exploration success to create a second mill, um, maybe have something like a Facola complex in that area. So uh, that, that also is being looked at. And I guess maybe the last thing that, that I think people forget about is that we do have the very real potential for underground at Fercola. Uh, we have started studies, preliminary studies, looking at, you know, what happens down plunge of the Fercola deposit to the north. While it's still open to the north, there is a resource there that, that we're starting to put a mine plan on, and, and there's no doubt that, that uh, the economics, at least preliminary, look very good. Um, so that study is also ongoing in, in 2022. So in, in short order, what do we have going on? We've got the phase one study. Uh, which is which will be uh, delivered to the government shortly. A phase two study, kind of at the scoping level, to determine how big does the mill have to be. 
We're optimizing the entire district. Uh, that's not due out by the end of the year. And at a scoping level, we're looking at underground. So those are all the things that are happening uh, within within the regional Mali development. Bill, maybe I think it's worth updating people a little bit. A lot of talk these days, we've discussed some of the inflationary pressures that the industry's seeing. But Mia, can you just talk a little bit and give us an update uh, for the Charles, the analysts on uh, <coughs> logistics and how we've been able to see our way through this uh, uh, obviously challenging time for the industry and, and uh, how, how we see that going forward between sanctions in Mali and between other, other things, between the supply issues. Uh, just maybe walk us through a little bit about, about that. Yeah, it, it, so it's actually a pretty interesting history if you think about it. So let, let's actually step back because these were questions we were having in 21. Uh, we had the, the you had the COVID-19 pandemic, and, and that, at that point, that really allowed us or really required us to take a look at all of our supply chain and figure out what was the best way forward. And so, during that time, we looked at Plan A, Plan B, Plan C, Plan D, and and, and really optimized our supply chains. Uh, then, if you remember, th there was there was a coup in Mali um, that really didn't even impact us because we'd already we'd already kind of optimized. Then uh, they there came the sanctions in Mali, which kind of ECOWAS shut off some of our supply routes. But because we'd had a good look at could we bring stuff in through Guinea or, or through Mauritania, um, while it certainly made us pay attention to where things are coming from, it didn't really impact us. And then, uh, you know, that, that might briefly hit upon it. When the sanctions came in, we, you know, it was one of those things we, we had to have a good hard look at. And so we did assume the worst case that potentially we couldn't get something in a timely fashion. And so we did change our mining sequence at the, in Q1 um, and and the material we were milling, but it, we quickly realized that, that our success was that, that we were going to be able to bring everything in, so we went back to normal operations. And then the last one, uh, which people talk about sometimes, is, is how is the war in Ukraine uh, with Russia really impacting us? Um, we used to get uh, our explosives out of Russia. We're now getting those out of South Africa. So we're, we're seeing that we've been able to adjust Right down the line to all to all the various uh, components that, that make up the supply chain. Well, I, I, I won't say that it is flawless and seamless. On the outside, it all looks great, but it is something that every day that we have to pay attention to. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Bill. Um, before we go for questions, I just uh, there may be a question on this, but I just wanted to cover uh, a couple of things off the Mali situation. Um, we continue to have excellent relations with the, with the government and, uh, and locally and federally. Um, every government we've seen in Mali for decades and current government that we expect going forward understands the critical importance of, of, of gold mining in Mali and then foreign investment to accomplish that working with uh, Malian partners, whether it be private or, or, or government. Uh, obviously, we're, we're excited about the potential of Anaconda in the very short term trucking ore down to uh, separate or to increase production through the mill and ultimately is there the potential for are we going to have just will exploration give us the results needed to look at uh, building a second mill as Bill calls it the Fukola complex um, uh, you know it's the potential to produce wave your arms a bit um, you know, approaching a million ounces a year from there subject to further drilling and subject to building an additional mill but those are pretty exciting opportunities so we're clearly um, happy in, in, in mining in Mali, and I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding about what that means. There's reasons why I ran gold and back in the day now, Barrick, and many other companies have, have had great relationships in Mali, uh, financing and, and, and uh, gold mines and being responsible. We do some great community stuff, which is all detailed on our, on our uh, website. But it's a good place to be. Mali is a good country to be in gold mining, and that has not changed, and we do not anticipate that changing. So as the... Uh, Government reaches agreement about uh, new elections within uh, hopefully within the next couple of years, uh, getting it back to democratically elected government. Um, we believe that Mali is going to be a good address to be, as still as the capability as we've demonstrated to show significant additional major gold deposits, world class deposits. And we think we may go to another one here with, with Anaconda. I'll just remind people when we acquired <coughs> the Bacola project from Papiano, did an excellent job of taking it through the first stage and, and into a feasibility study. We had 4 million ounces. In, Total of resources, so uh, clearly um, we've more than doubled that, and um, we, we think we're, we're really scratching the surface of literally almost up at Anaconda. So Mali is a good place to be, and we'll continue to champion Mali as other companies will, and try to it, have people understand why we're there, 
and then why it's a great opportunity going forward. In addition to continuing our, our, our geographical diversification with some of the things that, that we are doing elsewhere. Columbia, just want to touch on it in case there's a, a, there may be a question on this, but I'll give a little summary. Where we are, as, as we've said, and as you know, we're completing a feasibility study. It will be available in the third quarter. Uh, we're working closely with our partner, and then we'll go to Shanti with the operator, 50-50 joint venture. And I think uh, we are, and I'm sure AJ is anxiously waiting the results of the study. We've done some significant work to see if we could drop the capital cost by doing some, some legitimate uh, re-engineering, redesign. That seems to have had some success. The question is, what will inflation do uh, to, to, to cost us some of the gains we might have made by lowering the capital cost? We'll have a better view of that over the next two months internally. And then both parties will um, look at it and decide if they want to participate and make a development decision to build <coughs> a gravelogy mine, which could produce 400,000 ounces of gold a year if it has the economics to support the capital cost expenditure. Um, so we're in the same position of waiting to see the results of the study as our partner. And then there's different possibilities, whether if AGA decided they didn't want to participate, would we, would we buy them out? Um, or would you bring another partner in if we wanted to go ahead? So that will all come, I think, uh, become clear in the, as we get into the third quarter. Um, and we'll, we'll know about that. There, there has been some negative press come out, I guess, around another project in Columbia that um, the AG has called Cabredonna. And um, they, they had been pursuing a permit there and, and had had a few setbacks in terms of the government telling them to go back and do some more work, I guess, in terms of satisfying what the government pursued to stay issues and some of their requirements. I, I won't speak for AJ, but I'll just say that, that we think that the Gramolati situation is very different in terms of the location, the sensitivity of the location. We are in, in, in the right part of Antiochia, the northern Antiochia, with a, a strong mining history, tremendous local support. <coughs> we get asked all the time when we're down there by everyone, when are you going to start building this mine? So we believe that support will continue. There's an important election coming up here very shortly in Colombia. Uh, but we believe whichever uh, government goes forward in Colombia, we believe they're going to they have they understand the importance of moving away from oil and gas and coal, and we think gold mining could be something that's beneficial uh, to the to uh, Colombia. So we'll see how that goes. Um, at the end of right now, our relationships are excellent. Uh, AGA did some good work on social programs there, and we've done a lot of good work as well on looking at uh, relocation plans and things like that. Tremendous support. All over the government and also within the local population, which is critical for projects like this. It would be the first significant uh, open pit gold mine in uh, Columbia. So <clears throat> I just want to get those points across um, and uh, open it up now for questions. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we now conduct the question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, press star to the number one on the telephone keypad. If you'd like to withdraw your question, press star two. If you're using a speakerphone, please lift the hands up before pressing any keys. One moment, please, for your first question. Your first question comes from Habib Obey with Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Thanks, operator. Hi, Clive and uh, B2Gold, and, uh, you know, congrats on a good quarter, um, especially on the cash costs and all the sustaining costs. Um, so, so just starting off on that, um, you know, regarding the guidance uh, for, for first half, um, you know, Q1, obviously, uh, all the sustaining costs came in at 1036. Guidance for the first half is around 1250 to 1290. Uh, Mike, you touched a bit on uh, catching up on costs over the year. But are you being conservative on this guidance or for H1, or are you expecting costs to be significantly higher in Q2, or these costs are going to be spread out uh, throughout the year? Um, well, overall, based, like I said, I think we can expect that we'll see the benefit. It was, it was a very strong Q1, so we will see some of that roll into the first half for sure. I think we can expect that. But is it conservative to not re-guide the halves? Probably. Uh, but like I said, in my comments, but prices are quite volatile, and, and we are seeing quite a bit, especially in the oil and sustaining cost side, we're seeing some timing differences. You know, we, we were quite a long ways under in Q1, so you've got to remember that when you look at that oil-in cost for Q, or Q1. We, you know, we expect to see that reverse. Don't know the exact timing of that yet through the year, so we just felt because of the, some of the volatility you see in operating costs, and particularly in fuel, and then the timing of that capex that it was it was it was better just to maintain our guidance for the halves as we have them, and for the year overall. But but yes, in answer to your question, half one's probably still conservative, 
by maintaining that guidance. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike, for that. Uh, just uh, quickly switching gears to Anaconda, Bill, your 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 team is looking to complete a PEA on Anaconda as a standalone. Um, you know, several discussions have been in in terms of you know uh, Anaconda kind of becomes uh, you know a, a kind of a within the Ficola uh, complex. Now, within that, are you able to share infrastructure with Ficola in, in any way and and possibly reduce capex to develop uh, Anaconda? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that's probably one of the things that I should have talked about. You know, when you talk about capital costs for constructing an entire mill and infrastructure, you've really got to cut a lot of that out. I mean, even if you look at things like right now, we're looking at how do we how do we align a regional tailings facility? Well, you know, because that's a big capital cost. The the camps uh, are things you could expand. The workshops could be shared. Um, you know, all, all of that. The warehouses. So really, everything outside of outside of the mill, even the power, right? Remember that we've got that additional uh, 30 was it 36 megawatts of solar power there. Uh, so we've got extra capacity, and we're looking at it right now, which is one of the one of the things we didn't really I didn't emphasize, but we just picked up that Bacalobi property, which fits between the two. But that not only is that a good exploration target, that's an amazing opportunity for us to consolidate uh, our, our infrastructure. As I said, things like tailing facility, roads. Um, solar plant. There's, you know, we needed that room to the east. So there's a lot of good things really associated with that back of the license. Thanks for that, Bill. And and uh, my last question uh, is for Clive. I mean, in in regards to development of Gramalote, um, you know, or, or potential gra uh, development of Gramalote, um, is that completely exclusive of building Anaconda? I mean, if you go forward with Gramalote, does that impact Anaconda? And if you go forward with Anaconda, does that impact uh, Gramalote? Yeah, good question, Odes. And Bill can help me here, but we don't think so. We've always said we're not going to try and build with our tremendous ex uh, construction team. We're not going to try and build two significant mines at, or mills at the same time. But if you look at the potential sequencing with timing, if Gramalote is a go, and a lot of the uh, and construction will, will start as soon as we can get, we have a permit, but get the permit we, we uh, reissued with some of the changes that we've made or, or updated, I suppose. But if you look at the timing of all that, and we've looked at it quite closely, of course, then we definitely wouldn't see an issue where the Earthworks crews that would be doing the initial work at someone like Gramalati, if it's a go, would then potentially be able to move on. But this is also subject to, of course, the additional results that would justify potentially an anaconda and the sulfides building another mill. We don't know how far off we are. They're now to look at that. We may not be that far off in terms of the resource already and the kind of results we're seeing. But first of all, the priority there is to start trucking the satellite down. But if, 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 if things go to what we hope, then while we're trucking the satellite down for a number of years, a couple of years, whatever it's going to take to get the full permit to build a mill at anaconda, if appropriate, we would be producing 8,200,000 ounces a year from, from the Satellite, but while we build the mill, and then you just segue into the satellite, and everything else goes through the new mill and con. But if you look at the timing of that, if Gramalati's go, we see Gramalati being being, being um, not not first ahead of the satellite. That's just road building exercise, which we do. I'm not going to say it's a no-brainer for us, but pretty much is when you look at what we've done not only in Mali but around the world in terms of road construction, etc. So the first step is really um, pretty straightforward: building a road. We expect to get the permit for that by the end of the year. And as Bill said, there's multiple sources for ore to feed the Fakola mill with sampling material. So that, the rest of that story will unfold with a lot of drilling this year. I'm hoping by the end of this year we'll have a better idea of whether we think that another mill is, is, is likely to be the way forward, and then we'll start working on that, permitting that. So while we're doing that, we could very well um, be building a mill at um, Columbia, if appropriate. At so we, we don't see it being a sequencing uh, issue or problem because what you're talking about, what we're talking about is the phase two of Anaconda being a new mill. That would probably slot in after Gravelante from what we see today. Perfect. Uh, that's it for me, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Thanks, Avis. Good questions. Thank you. Your next question comes from Jordi Mark with Haywood Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning all. Um, and I'll follow on from Novace who asked a very good question there. Um, maybe with the solar, if I can, because I think it's a very interesting topic. 20% um, of your power is supplied from solar. Does it, uh, in Q1, does it warrant expansion of that plant given you know, the obvious uh, 
you know, trade-offs uh, or pay, quick paybacks with the oil prices and, and the potential expansion of, you know, Anaconda going forward? Um, or would you keep it at 36 megawatts at the moment? No, well, sir, maybe you could we're, – we're doing the studies right now, Jody, for sure. We see absolutely the possibility to expand that, that solar plant. Remember, not only – not only are we bumping up against what, what do we do engineering-wise as far as production, but you also have these ESG components, which everyone is focusing on more and more. And the reality is, is that that is one that you can really get some bang for your buck because we know it makes sense. We know that there's financial payback on it, and it's a good story, right? It's actually the right thing to do there. Okay, excellent. I mean, and, and maybe an extension on that one. Um, how about maybe it's um, obviously you've got, you've got a facility at, at um, Ojikotu, but uh, and you were, I believe, if I remember correctly, looking at potentially something at Masbate, but I'm not sure whether that's still on the on the cards. Yeah, so let's let's handle the Ojikoto one first. The, the Ojikoto one, what we've actually identified there, because Southern Africa has been so aggressive in in putting on uh, renewable energy, uh, Namibia has really re turned from a net consumer of power to a net generator of power. So what we're seeing now is that the power lines uh, are delivering power at much, much cheaper costs than we had uh, envisioned even when we designed the plant. So we're, we're, we have the ability now and we're in the process of connecting to the overhead power line, uh, which will once again reduce our costs. And once again, we get the ESG credit because that, that power is generating from the, uh, the hydro plant, real kind of hydro plant up north and solar power. So we're, we're going to get some benefit from that. We don't know, know exactly how much, um, but what we see is on off times, off peak times, we'll generate off the power grid and save money that way. During the daylight hours, of course, we'll run off the solar power and very little actually on HFO going forward after kind of in starting in Q3. And then uh, the Philippines, of course, we're looking at it. Um, that's one of those, if you've been there, you know that land is at a premium in the Philippines. So the question there is now where do you put it? Uh, Dennis is working with John Rahala really to identify areas, even things like do you, is there potential of floating them in the tailing facility, uh, the old waste dump area. All those areas are being looked at, but certainly we're having a hard, hard look at that. Okay, great. Thanks. And maybe one more question there um, before folding into others. Um, maybe on Anaconda, again, in terms of if you can remind us what potential scales you would be looking at in a we're considering in the PEA for futures you know, satellite facility or you know self-standing facilities, and then I'll leave it there. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm saying pre too preliminary to say right now, given the fact. I mean, we we do know that we want a truck between a million and a million and a half in phase one. What phase two looks like, don't know. What I will tell you is that, you know, we started out at four million tons per annum at Fakola. Uh, we're now at nine, and I remember the last time you asked me, can we go even more than that? Um, so, you know, which I would imagine is probably something at four or less to start with, with the ability to expand. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Your next question comes from Anita Sony with CIBC. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Similar um, question on uh, on Ficola. I guess um, Jordy asked kind of what I was getting to in terms of the um, overall size of uh, a standalone facility. I know uh, you're saying it's too early, but I was hoping that I could get maybe just one more detail. Uh, where would you? When would you think that would um, start up? Um, uh, if you were looking at something around the four million ton per annum mark. Yeah. Can, can I give you a bunch? Of, so I'm, I'm madly waving my hands and putting air quotes in the air right now, right? Because we don't have any of that data. I mean, let, let's let's just think about this. So if if we could do a Let's say we could do a preliminary study this year in the optimization and kind of a trade-off study and say that it looks like um, it, it, it's a go. And I know that there will probably be a resource out next year that we could then probably uh, put a study on. So let's say it takes us six, six months to do the study. Uh, the, at the same time, we're ordering equipment. The equipment comes in two and a half years to build it. Uh, my math shows that it's kind of 2026. Okay. And then a um, uh, second question would be, um, in terms of overall, uh, I guess we're always trying to figure this out, or at least I am, but um, uh, the COLA proper, you know, without the cardinal deposit and without the anaconda deposit, what's kind of a baseline scenario of, you know, what we should expect out of that asset over the next five years? 
So I, I think that information was put out in the PA. If you're talking about just Pecola proper, uh, or the, sorry, the updated feasibility study, which happened in 2020, uh, then you have to overlay Anaconda on top of that, and of course Cardinal, and the underground, and the increase in mill throughput. Okay, so if I go back to the 2020 PEA, that's a good starting base? Yeah, it's not the PEA, it's actually a feasibility study, but yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. Mr. Johnson, back over to you. Okay, uh, thanks everyone for uh, your time, and if there's other questions that occur to you, feel free to reach out to uh, uh, Randall Chatwin, and uh, he'll, uh, the, he'll put you on to the uh, member of the executive team that would be the appropriate one to find the answers to um, your additional questions. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, have a good day. Thanks, operator. Sanez. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes your conference call for today. We thank you for participating and ask that you please disconnect your line.